Welcome to the Orchestrate All the Things podcast. I'm George Amadiotis and we'll be connecting the dots together. Samba Nova just added another offering under its umbrella of AI as a service portfolio for enterprises, GPT language models. As the company continues to execute on its vision, we caught up with CEO Rodrigo Liang to look both at the big picture and under the hood. I hope you will enjoy the podcast. If you like my work, you can follow Link Data Orchestration on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So, uh, hi, uh, Rodrigo. Good, uh, good to meet you, and thanks for uh, making the time for uh, for the call today. I appreciate your agenda is pretty pretty full. So uh, let's uh, let's jump straight to the conversation, and I'm going to start. Well, since this is the first time that uh, we actually uh, uh, get to meet, uh, I would like to start by asking you uh, to say a few words on on Samba Nova itself, like uh, very very briefly the founder story, and uh, actually when you get past that uh, that point, what I'd like to focus uh, on is. Uh, uh, the whole concept of uh, data flow. I'm sure you've you've shared that story a number of times. So to give it a little bit of a twist and make it interesting both for you and my audience, who is uh, specifically interested in graph, I would like to uh, ask you to um, to highlight the uh, the graph processing aspects of of data flow. And I'm asking you this uh, this question because I read up a little bit uh, on, on data flow and I noticed that in other um, uh, mentions of data flow that uh, that you've had, you emphasize the, um, let's say, the uh, compiler is aspect of it. So I think there must probably be a connection to uh, the graph there. Of course, yeah. Thanks for having me. This is uh, a pleasure to meet you and, uh, and chat about our company. Um, the company is um, um, co-founded it with two Stanford professors, really thinking about kind of this next generation of computing, as, as, as we all know, this pre-AI pre -AI to post-AI transition is gonna affect all of us, right? It's gonna affect every company in every industry and in different ways, ways we haven't even thought about yet. Um, and it's actually in a lot of ways, a uh, existential question for many companies as far as um, making sure that they can adopt AI in an efficient way, right? In an efficient way with the right level of uh, results. You know, today, uh, it takes a lot of work for you to get AI uh, solutions into production, right? Not creating models, but using AI as a production level workflow for your business. And so that's ultimately what Summonova is about. You know, we, we thought about kind of the uh, water that needs that the businesses have, right? How do you end up creating a workflow or a solution that's good enough or, or sort of even better than what uh, humans can do and how can we replace those very manual workflows or very uh, error prone workflows with something that is a lot more accurate, right? And so um, you look at with the state of the art models today like GPT-3 and, um, and um, you know, a high, you know, high resolution uh, computer vision. I mean, it's getting to the stage where these uh, automated systems can do as well, if not better, than humans on a number of uh, so, you know, of tasks, right? And but what that requires is requires these large scale models with a lot of very um, uh, high performance infrastructure, and it requires expertise on how these models want to run. And it touches on the graphs that you're talking about, right? That uh, uh, if you are a um, you know, if you are one of the top uh, uh, 10 companies in the world, maybe you have thousands of data scientists and you can devote to it. But if you are a Fortune 5000 company and you don't have those, how do you build enough expertise to deploy a GPT-3 model, which, I mean, as a model, it's fantastic, right? I mean, GPT-2 even, it's, it's fantastic. And you know, these language models are getting to the point where it can do so many different things now. You just need to know how to deploy it. Right. And so what someone over decided to do was come in. And so it said, look, there, there isn't there just are not enough experts in the world to satisfy all the companies that need to have AI. These models are complex by nature. A simpler version is not going to be good enough to get to production. You need these state of the art models. You need them in order to replace the workflows that exist today. Right. So why don't you let Samanova come and do it for you? And your expertise focuses on collecting the right data, collecting, you know, getting the data for your business, making sure you understand what insights and what questions you want to ask, right? But the training inference, 
you know, all, all of the management of the models, we can do it for you as a subscription, you know? And so, uh, and we've you know, had pretty good success with it. You know, a lot of uh, uh, very, very expert uh, uh, organizations have signed on with Summonova, including the US government, uh, including, uh, uh, we just made an announcement today with uh, um, uh, 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 one of the larger banks in Europe uh, 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 subscribing to our uh, GPT service. And so uh, really excited about this model as a way to accelerate and get our customers jumping ahead. Right? You don't need to spend two years building up your AI team, building up your infrastructure, learning the models, training, all doing all of that work. We'll cut the line and within weeks, not months, weeks, you're up and running with state-of-the-art GPT. Right. And so um, so that's kind of uh, that's really what someone else is focusing on. Um, your second question was about graphs. Is that what it was? Um, yes. Well, uh, specifically on the um, on the on the foundation, let's say, of, of data flow, which I guess is the, um, you know, the, the core concept around which Samba Nova is based. So I would like to ask you, since, you know, as much as I've been able to, to read up on it, it seems like the, um, it was sort of built from the ground up in the way that reverses, let's say, the, uh, how, how chips were traditionally designed and built. So I would like right. you to um, elaborate a little bit on, on that philosophy. And uh, again, uh, as far as, as I've been able to tell, it looks like there, there are some parallels to how uh, compilers, for example, uh, work. And uh, this is where I see the, uh, the connection to graph and graph processing. And since this is a topic I have a personal interest in, I was wondering if you could uh, make the connection basically. Yeah, exactly right. And, and, and look, you know, some of the, we, we were a software first company. So when uh, my co-founder started this uh, research and they're professors at Stanford, just, you know, I mean, just amazing folks uh, uh, that that uh, redefined the way that uh, uh, computing works at different layers of the hardware and software stack over over many decades, right? And so, uh, so they're actually much better uh, at explaining this, but I'll do my best. Um, but if you really think about, um, Kind of how these uh, neural nets work, right? What it is is just interconnection of the, all these nodes. Where you're doing actual computation in order for you to figure out to see if you know the um, the output of that one cycle computation is a better result, a higher light, you know, a higher uh, accuracy result than your previous cycle, and you just can, can continue to do uh, those iterations over and over again. Right, the way that computing happens for that type of computation today is, you know, is what people call kernel by kernel. Right, you know, you're just looking at what's happening right in front of you today. You bring it into your computational engine, most likely a GPU today, maybe a CPU, and you actually look at that, compute that, and you store the results somewhere, and then you load the next kernel in to try to figure, okay, now what do I do next? Right, and then you say, oh, I need the inputs of the previous thing. Let me bring that in. Then I do some computation, and then I store the results of that again. And then I'll, I'll bring the next kernel, figure out, okay, now what, what does this thing need? Well, what happens in that particular mode is, one, you have to do these computations, and the intermediate results between these kernels have to get stored somewhere, usually off chip. And this is why you see this big boom in HBM, high bandwidth memory, because you're doing a lot of handshakes between the computational engine and some very intermediate memory. Right, it's all scratch. All, all that, all that data is not actually uh, uh, kept. I mean, this big scheme of things, not kept, kept in perpetuity. Right? It's not. It's not you know something that you need for a long, long time. It's just very short amount of time to store in between while your computational engine is starting to swap out the kernels. Right? And so, um, and then the second thing that you don't have is you actually don't know which kernel is coming next. As a computational engine. You did your computation and then you send it back and you let the host send you the next computational uh, kernel. And then you start figuring out, oh, what do I need? Oh, yes, I, the previous data was stored here. Let me go get it, right? And so it, it, it's, um, it's very hard to plan resources when you don't know what's coming, right? We, when you don't know what's coming and you don't know what all the resources you might need. And so one of the beauties of us uh, doing the way that we've done this is and started with the compiler stack was, the first thing you want to do is say, look, these neural nets are very predictable, right? I mean, you know exactly what it, you take a GPT model, I mean, all the interconnections, you know them way in advance, mm -hmm. as big as they are, right? As big as they are. You can take a fairly small model, like a resonant model, or, you know, take something as, as, as big as GPT, they're all predictable. You can see all these interconnections between them way in advance, 
right? And so what we want to do with our technology is just say, look, why don't we let, you know, because the, the models are getting so big that the human eye and the human mind were not you know, made to optimize for it, right? But compilers do a great job at that, right? And so if you allow the tool to come in and unroll the whole graph, and just see every layer of the graph, every interconnection that you might need, where the section cuts are, where all the high, you know, critical latency uh, 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 interconnections are, where the high bandwidth connections are, right? If you run roll the whole graph and you get an entire map of what you need, then you do a, you, you actually have a chance of figuring out kind of how to really optimally run this particular graph, right? And so then you say, okay, well, now that I have the software stack that does this automatically because the human mind is, you know, really, you know, not, not, not optimum for figuring these, those things, especially the dynamic nature of it, right? As graphs move, sometimes you need high bandwidth, sometimes you don't, right? It depends on which part of your loop you're running, right? And so, but, you know, these, uh, uh, these compilers are fantastic at that. And that's what we have. It's something I will call Samba flow, but it's tremendous in being able to do that. Once you have that, your next question is, well, what hardware substrate can run that the best, right? Because everything ex that exists today, CPUs, GPUs, even FPGA, they, what, what they know how to do is one kernel at a time, right? One little, and then let me feed, and then store an HPM and let me take the next one. That's one, one kernel at a time. So what we decided to do here is to say, look, actually what you really need is you need a substrate, a hardware substrate that wants to match to the data path that the graph has already determined in bandwidth and bus size, you know? And so what you really need is you want something that allows you to then take this graph that you unrolled, take all the bandwidth and latency requirements that you figured out that's optimally to run this particular network. And then you wanna just map it exactly as this and, and to keep the data on chip. So you feed the outputs of one kernel straight into the inputs of the next one without leaving the chip. So all of these bandwidth requirements that you need for memory and things like that, they, they, they get reduced dramatically because you're not storing all this intermediate data just because you're swapping kernels, right? And so that's really fundamentally what we're doing with someone else. We're just keeping all of these graphs in interconnections that we already know about in relation to each other, optimally tied together so that you can feed the machine as the graph is moving through and you can make all the orchestration way in advance, right? And you can scale mm -hmm. it, you know, put many graphs on one chip. You can put one graph in hundreds of chips, right? Because the compiler doesn't care. It's just all basically bandwidth and latencies that's optimizing around, right? And so that's basically at the core of it. And what you see is uh, some of our most sophisticated customers in the US government, for example, saying, hey, by turning that on, they're getting eight to 10X, sometimes 20X advantage compared to their uh, um, GPU uh, uh, results that they've uh, optimized for years, right? And so, and that's um, that's really the power of a data flow type of architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess that, um, that also, um, Preemptively, let's say, answers a uh, follow-up question that I had. So uh, another core choice that uh, you seem to have made is the fact that, well, you don't ship uh, on board uh, chips that uh, you can that others can integrate in their existing servers or architectures, but you basically ship you either ship the entire um, the entire box, including network connections and everything, or you make that available as a service. And I guess the reason that you're doing that is uh, what you just described that you have this very unique ar architecture that. That I, say, I, I suppose would not be you would not be able to uh, to work uh, by uh, just integrating in uh, in uh, existing servers. Let's say. Well, we could. I mean, we could. You know, I've been asked many times, "Will you sell us the chip?" Right. But um, but here's I go back to the, my initial claim: the large majority of the world do not have the AI expertise to take chips at this raw level. You know, the 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 software at the kind of lower level and implement into solutions, right? And really what we're focused on is getting as many of the Fortune 5,000 companies to production and AI solutions as possible, right? Versus trying to talk to as many AI developers as possible, right? And which we do those as well, right? The developers love creating new models, but really what we, our thesis of the company is saying, look, these models are getting to a point where they're fantastic, like, like a GPT model, where they're just fantastic. Really what people need is for us to productize it for them. Mm -hmm. Right. Pre-train the model, bring the model to their data, get them in, into production, allow them to actually run it, 
monitor it, maintain it, you know, checkpoint it, all the things that you have in production, you can just sign up to Sambanova and we'll take care of all of that. Right. And so, so really that's the, 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 the uh, form factors we offer really is more a function of who we're actually trying to cater to versus, you know, the const- technical constraints of the device. You know what I mean? Like we're general purpose. We can download models from all these different depots and push of a button because we have this compiler stack, push of a button, you can compile and run and train it and get state of the art results, both in terms of accuracy. In many cases, we actually set the world record for performance, right? So we can do all of those things. And yet for a large part of our customer base, that's inventing a new model is not their biggest problem. Their biggest problem is I want to deploy in production. Right. And so, mm-hmm. so, that, so that they call us because then we can come in and say, okay, well, you know, to, to do a document classification uh, uh, solution for your contracts, it takes us many. And so we come in, we just deploy our standard systems with GPT and you subscribe to it. And, and, and the beauty of it is it eliminates this large uh, um, um, expert headcount need for data scientists that most people are having a hard time hiring for. Right. It eliminates this large infrastructure upfront cost that many of them have to go buy because you know, you're just subscribing. So you're actually just uh, uh, paying a monthly fee to infrastructure that we deploy anywhere you want, including their own site, right? And then ultimately, as the model evolves and changes, you don't need to have the expertise to keep up with it and say, hey, do I need this new model? Or should I change that model? Right? We, we do it all day long. This is what we do. And so we will, under the hood, change the models as appropriate for our customers. And so it makes it really easy for them to actually say, okay, well, I don't want to be an AI shop, right? My business is X. Let me let Samanova be my AI shop. And I can get the benefits of AI without having to invest so much um, uh, time, money, and energy into, um, into getting the capabilities that I think everybody's going to need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think what you just described is well uh, another way of uh, of uh, of framing what one of your co-founders, uh, Chris Ray, has uh, has termed uh, data-centric AI. So basically, what his his position is like, well, okay, all these models are, are great and everything, but we've reached the point that they're kind of a commodity anymore. So you should focus on your on your specific data. And I guess you're facilitating that by giving people the infrastructure to let them cater to their specific uh, data for their domain and just like let you take care of the rest. Exactly right. Exactly right. And and again, you know, th- there will always be certain classes of model where innovation will continue to be there and allows you to do some new things. But for large classes of models, they're starting to get to the point where they're just fantastic, right? They do a lot of really good things already. And the new increases in uh, improvements in accuracy uh, are are helpful, but they're they're now getting to the point where they're incremental. Right. And so so if you can just take the current existing models and make it easy for people to deploy, right? Easy for people to consume, easy for people to get results quickly, right? Not months, but days or weeks, you know, you're up and running. Not and and you don't have to have hundreds of people managing because as you know, some of these models are so big, it's like yeah, a thousand, a thousand chips aggregated together to run one model, right? You sneeze and you get the wrong result, right? And so we try to eliminate all of those things so that. When we deploy it, we deploy a solution that we believe is right, right? That we've trained it to be correct and we maintain it for you. And so, so that's really kind of our model here to make sure that um, you know, you're getting, you're getting um, what everybody else has spent years developing, right? You can jump the line and you can get the same, you know, actually you can get better because we, we set the world record on a, a number of these things. You can get better without having to actually invest all the time and energy. Um, and get you know capabilities that uh, um, you know other companies have spent years developing. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of the um, I guess iconic models that you, that you referred to, and uh, also I think one of your latest announcements uh, was the uh, making GPT uh, available on on Samba Nova as a service, and uh, that was new to me because you know la- last time I checked, so uh, before I read up for uh, for this discussion, actually uh, the only um, the only way I knew of that uh, people could access uh, GPT three specifically was well uh, via via OpenAI's uh, API uh, in conjunction with with Microsoft. So, I was wondering uh, about the details, basically, of what it is that you license. Is it like a joint project with uh, with OpenAI? Is it the previous version of uh, GPT, or how how does it work exactly? 
Yeah, the GPT-3 model, and again, we'll do it, you know, we'll, we'll do a whole class of GPT. Some people, you know, as you know, GPT-3, as big as it is, as powerful as it is, uh, uh, not everybody needs the full 175 billion GPT-3 uh, model. And uh, so some people want a 13 billion model, some people want a one and a half billion mo uh, perimeter model, right? So we can range, and but the construct of a GPT model is pretty, um, uh, very similar, right? And so, and it's one of those things that we, as, as we talk more and more of our customers that um, a lot of people really wanted to have access to this model. You know, they do believe that this is the model that gives them the maximum flexibility for the next many, many years. And it's gonna to continue to evolve, but the construct of it is really valuable. Like I said, this, the model you know, can do so many different things um, these days and it becomes one of those assets that every every company needs to figure out a way to get access to it because it's, it, it, it's the type of model that, like we said, is getting to the point where if you have it, it's gonna be really you know great for a large number of things. You don't really need to invent a lot of new models, right? And so, um, so but the problem was exactly what you said, the access to it was difficult. So we actually just announced this morning uh, uh, our first customer on this GPT DAS, right? So uh, it's it's a large European bank. Um, basically, um, what we do here is you you want the access to this type of model. We'll deploy our infrastructure anywhere. It's actually our systems, right? Our software stack, our people that manage that model, right? We'll train it to accuracy. We'll actually fine tune it on your data, and then we'll bring it to wherever you want. In this particular case, it's actually going to be on their own on-prem, on their own uh, data center side. This is so users of it. It's not like they're sharing because there's privacy questions about um, my data. I can't have it, you know, in different places. So we'll put it behind their firewall, completely uh, uh, um, dedicated to their use case, and they just subscribe to it. They, they pay us by month. Right, and so it's a type of model that now suddenly you have your own private access to a GPT model, as big as that is, right? A GPT model, you can all your folks in the company can use it for whatever it is that you need. We maintain the model on your behalf, right? And so, and, and that's a perfect example of how you know uh, banks. Or these are you know, I mean, banks and you know, traditionally uh, fairly. Uh, uh, sophisticated and diligent institutions when it comes to technology are jumping the line, jumping the line and say, hey, I need that. I'm going to deploy it. I'm going to deploy it in this way, right? Because I don't want to go and create it myself. Some of you come and do it for us, and we're going to deploy it everywhere for all of our users inside the bank, right? And so um, so that's kind of what we're doing, and we're doing, we can replicate that recipe over and over again because, again, we've integrated all of this into a nice compact uh, infrastructure that allows us to deploy the service in a way that you don't even know kind of what the hardware needs to look like, right? <laughs> you know, like a lot of people talk about, oh, it's all, all these chips and all these, you know, in, uh, networking, all this stuff, but we hid it all away, right? So let somebody know take care of it. We'll deploy it. You just tell me what your SLAs are, right? How quickly you need these things. We'll size that for you and we'll deploy wherever you need it, right? And that's kind of, uh, and, and that's effectively what, uh, now, this particular bank has done with us, and uh, we're super excited about that collaboration. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you already answered the uh, the other part I was wondering about. So basically, uh, fine tuning the domain because, well, yes, I mean GPT three in itself is super super useful and everything, but there's a number of reasons why people would want to fine tune it to their domain. Um, you know, competitive differentiation, and they want to have their own data and all yeah. of that. But, but I guess you also do that. So that points me to the next, uh, well, set of questions really, which is about your uh, your business model. Because based on what you said, it sounds like uh, part of it, at least, is based on services. So I was wondering if if I'm right about that, and then. Um, yeah, how does your um, what what's the mix that you uh, that you play on basically? The services in that I mean, we think of ourselves as a more I don't know, a flexible platform, right? You think of a service more like yeah, if you're if you're in the world of CRM, it's more like a Salesforce, right? And Accenture. I mean, we we actually partner with you know a lot of really great. Uh, uh, um, uh, companies that help us with a lot of the customizations, right? That uh, customers need because we don't do the, uh, that level of work. We're really more about deploying our platform in a flexible way. If you look at kind of what types of models, I mean, obviously, if you look at our infrastructure, you know, you 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 you've looked at uh, data flow architectures, and you know, I mean, we can run anything that people want, really, right? We're general purpose platform. We can we can train, we can infer, we can run, 
uh, uh, computer vision models, recommendation models, LSTM. We can run all sorts of different things, right? And 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 people do, right? You know, our our U.S. government uh, partners uh, run some really really sophisticated models. You know, we have one that they publish where they map the universe. I mean, it's, they run all sorts of different things, right? And so, um, but really, where you see us focus on the data flow as a service, we focus on three classes of models, right? Just three of the hundreds we could, right? You know, because these are the things that we've actually determined that our customer base is looking for us to deploy in production, right? So that those are natural language, computer vision, and specifically where you have high resolution computer vision, we, we feel like the, in the enterprise, you need high res. And today people don't realize that most of the existing technology is not able to break through into high resolution, right? And so we'll talk about that, but then recommendation system, which you know, you know, it's kind of the, the what powers the, uh, our, our internet economy, right? And so, uh, so we decided that those are really the three classes of models that we will deploy as a service. But really what we do is these are pre, determine models we use size of you know there's some flexibility about kind of how big you run it and how quickly you know those, those, we can give you that little flexibility but it's not really service in, in in the in the traditional word of like we're customizing it right we're um we're not uh um we bring others in to help us for things that are outside the knobs that the, our platform gives you, but within the flexibility the platform gives you, it gives you a lot, right? You can increase the parameter count, you can change the models, and you can do a bunch of different things. But that's why we say, we're gonna look at our models more like how Salesforce kind of sells it for CRM. So it's, it's a platform for you to run these types of models and we'll actually maintain it on your behalf, right? We'll maintain the accuracy on your behalf. And as you know, as, as you, you can train and then you can deploy, you can do inference on our systems, as you know, Chris will talk about this as well. Others will, but as you run in production, models drift, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you sometimes need is you need a little bit of a, a little bit of retraining, right? You know, mm -hmm. as you're in production, and most systems have to go through this big cycle of retraining, requalifying, where some and over because we're at one platform where we actually train and and and, and we distill to what you know to, to our own targets that you can actually every so often retweak it right so they maintain an accuracy and that's a key part of how we maintain um, good results for for a customer that in the same platform we can do multi tenant multi tenant inference and have lots and lots of people in production. And then suddenly collapse it, pause that, collapse to do a train, a retrain on the model just to tweak it back up, and then we're back to multi-tenancy, right? And so, so I think we can do a lot of very flexible things that allow us to keep uh, what we believe are um, our production level facilities, right? Production level functions that customers expect and need. Mm -hmm. Okay, and final one to, to wrap up, we're almost out of time. So you've already gone a long way. So you've raised a number of pretty pretty big uh, rounds so uh, you you know you have a really uh, high valuation as well it sounds like you're growing your customer base and so what's uh, what's your roadmap so what what where do you want to be in like i don't know uh, 6 months or a year from now well i mean it's uh it's a uh, there's a race going on right and 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 people people aren't always aware right in, in their own verticals that there's a an ai race going on Right, and uh, you think about the banks, you think about manufacturing, you think about healthcare, you think about you know uh, um, all these different sectors, you know, where people are using AI as an opportunity to catapult their position within that you know within their their sector, right? And and I mean, you've seen this; it's not just someone over. I mean, just the entire industry of AI. There's a lot of really disruptive things going on, right? Of which we play one part of that, um, but. Uh, uh, we look at that. You know, we we look at our job as really trying to enable this disruption, right? That we can go into these verticals, and we aren't necessarily the experts for all of those industries, right? We partner with a lot of great customers and great partners for those sectors. Um, but what we can do is we provide you a platform to really disrupt and create new ways to to compete in that industry in a way that's pretty disruptive. It kind of, I, 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 I always say it feels like this pre-AI to post-AI transition is going to be as big, if not bigger than the internet. And there are a lot of signs that tell you that, right? There are a lot of signs that look, it's not going to be an incremental change. Entire ways that work is being done today will disappear. Right? Just because the robots can come in and do it better, they're more efficiently and you can kind of remove entire chunks of work. And so if people are looking at AI as, hey, I can tweak it and run it, run, run a particular thing 10% more efficient, that's too that's thinking too small, right? Because we are talking with people and they're 
looking at, hey, here's 30% of my workflow. I'm going to just remove all of it. <laughs> and they're just going to take all of that away and let the machines take over. And, and that's the power of AI. And so we're super excited in the next five to 10 years as our partners and our customers and all, all other folks are getting these solutions to production and we're enabling them. Um, it's going to be really exciting because I think when you know, we, we, we think that we have a critical role to play in enabling that, right? And enabling it in production in a way that people can rely on it, right? It's no longer part of a, AI research or AI labs or AI, you know, this is in production. And that's really ultimately kind of what we started the company for. How do we get customers into production and creating value for their mission critical applications? Okay, well, great. Uh, sounds like you have well, uh, your, your work lined up ahead of you. So uh, best, best of luck and I uh, hope uh, we'll be able to, uh, to catch up sometime soon again. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you like my work, you can follow Link Data Orchestration on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook.